It's good to see you. Thanks for coming to Grace today. I want to welcome you here in EP, everyone at the chapel, everyone at our Chassa campus, and everyone online. Thank you so much. Uh, we are kind of in a teaching series, finished First John, so we're going to pick up today in Second John. It's only one chapter, not John 2, but Second John, so if you want to make your way there, Second John. You know, one of the, uh, one of the massive advantages, I think, in, in knowing, being aware of church history is that you realize that Solomon was 100% right, 100% accurate, that there is nothing new under the sun. Like this, this proverb has like proven true like over and over and over again. When it comes to all of the counterfeit versions of Christianity that have popped up throughout church history. You know, it seems like every few years or so, yet another group rises up insisting that they have found a new and improved Christianity. And that is like the way to go. It's God's new endorsed Christianity. Well, we know that, that that hype dissipates quickly when you realize that this new version really isn't new at all. It's what church history does. It helps you to see that we've been there and we've done this before. And most of the times, it's, it's just a, a repackaged version of a heresy that has already been faced and rejected previously. Now, I, I'm not at all suggesting or saying that the church has no room for change or improvement. I'm not saying that at all. Just like individuals need sanctification, so does the church. But I think that, I think that we need to be wary of anything that presents itself as a new and shiny version of the Christian faith. A Christianity 2.0, if you will. The, the most current example of this, I think, is, is called progressive Christianity. And we've kind of talked about this a, a little bit in the past few months. Progressive Christianity ha has led numerous ministry leaders and artists and professors and young adults in particular to kind of back off and deconstruct their commitment to Christ and commitment to the church. So I want to introduce you to a, a, to a great book entitled The Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity. It is a great work by Michael J. Kruger. I would urge you to take a screenshot of that and grab a copy of this. You can like order it right now where you're seated. And because today what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you kind of briefly the, kind of the Cliff Notes version of the book. I know you're thinking because you're frugal. Well, if you give me the Cliff Notes version of the book, why are you encouraging me to buy the book? Well, you still need to read the entire book. It's worth the read. But before I kind of roll through what these Ten Commandments are, I want you to listen to what Kruger himself has to say about the Ten Commandments of progressive Christianity. He says, and I quote, as you study these Ten Commandments, they sound like they were gathered not so much on the mountaintop in a face-to-face -face with God, but in a university classroom. They are, less, they are less about God revealing his desires, but more about man expressing his. Think more Oprah, less Moses. And that's kind of the vibe of what you're going to feel and sense with progressive Christianity. This is like a master class in, in half truths, which sound really, really enticing and appealing on the surface, until you scratch around a little bit and dig around a little bit and explore their foundations and their implications, okay? So here are the 10 commandments of progressive Christianity sweeping through the church today, and, and I mean wreaking havoc in the church today. Number one, Jesus is a model for living. I'll put it on the screen here. Jesus is a model for living more than an object for worship. Translation, Jesus isn't divine, but rather a good moral teacher. Number two, Affirming people's potential, and you, you hear this in preaching today. Affirming people's potential is more important than reminding them of their sinfulness. Translation, sin is not a problem. It's not our biggest problem. People are essentially and basically good. Number three, the work of reconciliation should be valued over making judgments. So this whole progressive movement is all about anti-judging, anti-judging. When the Bible says that we're not to be judgmental, but we do have to make judgments and assessments. So the translation is this, Christians should stop being so judgmental and intolerant. 
And so I, I don't know if you've picked up on this or not, but we have gone like way past, way past the agree to disagree stage in culture today. Like any dissent, any disagreement today is just considered hatred and, and bigotry and intolerance. Number four, gracious behavior is more important than right belief. Translation, theology really doesn't matter. Quit pushing theology, quit pushing the Bible in everybody's face. Just be a good person and just be nice. Number five, inviting questions is more valuable than supplying answers. How many of you have heard that and kind of felt that in our culture? Like we can't be certain means this. Like we can't be certain really about what we believe. We really can't be certain about anything because truth is not actually attainable or accessible. So, so we just have to ask good questions. Number six, encouraging the personal search is more important than group uniformity. Translation, the church is just about protecting its authority and squashing dissent. So you're starting to pick up the vibe here on what progressive Christians think about the, the institutional and organized church. Certainly not a pro-church approach here. Number seven, meeting actual needs is more important than maintaining institutions. Translation, too much focus on the church gets in the way of God's mission. So notice how, notice how many in this progressive Christian movement are trying to separate out the mission of God from the church of Jesus Christ. You do realize that the mission of missions is the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? It is all about the church of Jesus Christ. Christ. Jesus Christ founded the church, right? This is his brainchild. This is his invention. Number eight, peacemaking is more important than power. Translation, since the church abuses its power, that power should be taken away and stripped entirely. Number nine, we should care more about, think about this one, we should care more about love and less about sex. Translation, God doesn't care what you do in the bedroom if your heart is in the right place. Number 10, life in this world is more important than the afterlife. Translation, no one knows what happens, really happens after you die. So, so just focus, right? Focus on fixing the present world. And so when I call progressive Christianity, Christianity, you do understand it's really not Christianity. You understand it's not that at all. It's not a wing of Christianity. It's not a branch of Christianity. It is an altogether different religion. It is a false gospel. So you need to understand that at the outset. Essentially, it is a, a man-made system of morality that lacks any real hope or vision for the future. Moreover, there is no good news whatsoever in progressive Christianity. It's not good to mangle the identity of Jesus. It's not good to tell people that their salvation hinges upon what they do, what they don't do, their good works. And it's not true that we can't really be certain of anything. Listen, just because you don't know doesn't mean that we can't know, amen? So people kind of throw their hands, well, I don't know, I don't know. Just because you don't know doesn't mean that we can't know because there's tons of truth that we can know with certainty in the scripture. And so ultimately the question here is how people should respond to and react to truth. What kind of relationship should we have with the truth? Is it an inconvenience or is it indispensable? Well, this is exactly the message of, of 2 John. Look what he says in verses one and two. John writes this, the elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, verse two, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Now, now most people believe that the elect lady and her children is a metaphor for the church and her people. And, and I agree with that. I think it flows contextually, makes perfect sense using that metaphor to suggest what John is saying here. Notice though, right out of the gate, John's message is to accentuate, to highlight, to prop up, let everyone see the role and the value of truth. He says that truth is real. He says that truth really matters, that truth is actually attainable and knowable and accessible. Uh, he even says truth abides in us. He says that truth will be with us 
forever. John then celebrates the fact that some people in the church and some of their children are walking in the truth as commanded by God. Look in verse four. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. Because so remember in 1 John, a lot of false teachers had infiltrated the church. We're trying to get in people's homes, lead people astray. But there was a group that kind of made it out alive, if you will. Didn't get sucked into all the false ideologies, but stayed with the truth, embraced the truth, walked in the truth. Now, I, I think we would all agree, right? There's no greater joy as a parent than seeing our children walk in the truth. Like seeing our children really know and follow Jesus Christ for themselves. Not because we want them to, but because they have the desire to follow Christ. It is, I think, the goal of all parenting. Uh, we want our kids to be successful, but more importantly, we want our kids to know the Savior, right? And we all need to double down on making sure our kids know that they know Jesus Christ. Then in verses five and six, John reminds them of truths that they've already heard before. Look in verse five. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we've had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment just as you've heard from the beginning. So you should walk in it. You know, I think a large part of living a flourishing Christian life and living Christianly is, is like doubling down on the truth that you already know. So it's not like, hey, I need this new truth. No, you just, you need to live out and walk in the truth that is already in front of you. And that's exactly what John is doing and saying here. Do what you already know to be true. Love one another and walk in the truth. Now, I'm gonna to confess to you that, that I, didn't, I didn't realize this. I didn't know until just like a few days ago in prepping for this, this message today, that the idea of progressiveness, that the idea of progressiveness is actually in the Bible, that the word and the idea of progressiveness is actually in the scripture. Look at what it says in verse seven. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. We've talked about that in 1 John. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we've worked for but may win a full reward. And here it is, look at verse nine. Everyone who goes on ahead, underline that phrase, goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching, stays in the teaching, has both the Father and the Son. So in verse, in verse nine, the one Greek word for the phrase goes on ahead is the word proago, P-R-O-A-G, long O. Proago is translated as everyone who progresses. So John is basically saying everyone who is progressive and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. So, so the message, we know is a paraphrase, but it actually nails the interpretation here in verse nine. Here's what it says. Anyone who gets so progressive in his thinking that he walks out on the teaching of Christ, walks out on God. But whoever, and I want you to look at these words, but whoever stays with the teaching, whoever stays faithful to both father and the son, Stays is, a, is another word for abide, stays put with the truth, stays locked and loaded in and on and around the truth. So, so here John uses the word progressive to feature people walking out on the teaching of Christ, progressing past the truth. In other words, a person can ditch the Christian faith, not just by like swerving to the left or swerving to the right, but by running past the truth, like leaving the truth in the rear view mirror behind them and then embracing things that do not align with the faith once and for all delivered for the saints. And so currently, this, I, I think this is where we find a lot of people in the church today, kind of like racing 
past the truth and then clamoring for, looking for a, a new truth. And so people in the progressive Christian camp, there's like, a, there's like a restlessness, there's like a frustration with the truth. So they want, what? they want change, progress, change. They want things to be different, especially change and progress that fits the spirit of the times, that aligns with what is actually happening and playing out in culture. Now, listen, I agree. I agree there are a lot of non-essential things that, that need to change from age to age, from culture to culture. Not arguing with that. But truth is not one of them. Amen? A lot of things need to change, but truth does not need to change. The truth about Christ doesn't need to change. The truth about the Bible doesn't need to change. The truth in the Bible doesn't need to change. The truth about the gospel doesn't need to change. The epitome, listen to this, the epitome of pride. The epitome of pride is to personally decide the Bible needs your help. Think about that. The Bible needs my help and I'm going to fix the Bible. You know, in actuality, over, over the past few months in particular, I've noticed a disturbing trend that a lot of the people, I'm sure you'll affirm this, a lot of the people taking shots at the Bible today haven't even read the Bible. And we're like, yeah, hey, hey, we better pay attention to that. They, these are people who haven't even cracked open the book who are taking on the book. The Babylon Bee had a, a meme that I think hammers home exactly what I'm talking about. And by the way, this is satire at its best, okay? So I'm gonna put it on the screen so you can see it. This is really funny, I saw this, I thought this is perfect. Man who doesn't read the Bible, also chief authority on what Jesus would do today. <laughs> of course, of course. And then it creates this fictional little article here. And, and ironically, in Winter Lake, Minnesota, I don't know if that place even exists. Local man, I'll read this, it's really funny. Local man Curtis Bevins, Bevins has, who's not opened the Bible a single time in his life and doesn't believe a word it says, is here to tell you that everything you believe about the Bible is wrong. <laughs> Jesus would never say or do any of that if he were here today, replied Curtis Bevins on a recent Facebook post. Bivens has been proudly patrolling the Facebook comments section for years, always ready to set the record straight about your misguided thoughts on the Bible and the person of Jesus. Just take it from me. Jesus was all about love and he was never angry and he was never frustrated or divisive, explained Bevins while adjusting his tortoise shell glasses. In fact, if he were here today, I'm certain he wouldn't be rebuking people. Instead, he'd be celebrating them for being their true selves. In response, many people took his side lest they get called out and look like big dummies in the comment section. He sounds pretty confident. I guess we should just listen to this guy and take his word for it, said Jordan Hankins. I'd check my Bible, but it's all the way across the room and I'm sitting down. That's how a lot of people <laughs> respond, don't they? Why are we taking our cues from culture on the Bible? Why are we, why are we backpedaling on the Bible based on the comments from people who've never read the Bible, who don't know the God of, of the Bible. Like, like all of this like made, made me wonder, like what's causing like so many people to get sucked into this kind of ideology and deconstruct their faith, to run straight past the truth, to clamor for some new truth. Well, here's a part of, of what I see happening, kind of the, the mechanics of deconstruction, if you will. So I've, I've been like noodling on this for some time, kind of like trying to get this nuance so we can kind of figure out what happens, why it happens, how it happens so that we can catch it when it does. So let me kind of just kind of tease out what happens here. Culture takes a position on a social issue that the Bible opposes. The majority of culture then quickly gets on board, signs up, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, in an attempt to show solidarity and sympathy. 
Yet when Christians refuse to get on board with said position, they're considered hateful, bigoted, intolerant, mean-spirited, anti-whatever. Well, no one, like no one signs up for that. No one wants to be considered hateful, bigoted, or intolerant. And so there are a lot of Christians who, 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 get, who get frustrated and, and disillusioned with the Christian truth. And they, they get frustrated with the truth because it's so truthful. <laughs> and it's so oppositional to culture. And so after a while, their feelings turn into this like misguided compassion and that misguided, like unsanctified compassion kind of gets the best of them creating a, like a deep seated bias. And so now they only concentrate on books and resources and podcasts that confirm what they want to believe and what they feel is fair and just. And then what happens is that a, I would describe it like a, like a, a rift emerges, a rift begins to grow between them and the Bible. Uh, a rift grows between them and, and the church. So this, this causes them to get really agitated and frustrated with the church. It also causes them to start getting squishy and soft with any scripture that actually opposes the direction of culture on social issues. Said passages are treated then as because they know the Bible a little bit, they know it well enough to say, well, those are cultural leftovers. Those are translation errors. Uh, Jesus never addressed this or that. Uh, those are just unloving clobber verses. Uh, they're hostile and they're in need of a 2023 refresh and update. And it's, it's here, I think, that people start to kind of like untie themselves from the Bible and untie themselves from the church and then untie themselves from, from historic Christianity. All in the name, and this is where it's so insidious and people get like confused. All in the name of progress, all in the name of love, all in the name of compassion. Now they create this like new, in their mind, this new and enlightened framework that allows for exceptions in the scriptures. The enemy then exploits this decision by provoking them to only see and interpret scripture through the lens, and hear this, through the lens of what culture says is logical. Through the lens of what culture says is loving through the lens of what culture says is fair and equitable and inclusive. And since previous compromises with scripture have been made, it's easy to continue down this path. And so now everything in the Bible is up for grabs and reinterpretation because the Bible is, is hurting people. The Bible is oppressive. The Bible is outdated. And the Bible then needs to catch up with our or sophisticated culture. Thus, a new religion is born, i.e. progressive Christianity and her 10 commandments. And what it is ultimately is, it is a religion without any convictions. It is a religion without any convictions whatsoever. It is a, it is a religion without any certainty. It's the, I don't know, therefore no one can really know. It is a religion where love means everything and nothing. Where it means everything and nothing. It is, a, it is a religion where obedience is no longer connected to love. Did you notice how John utilized that in 2 John? You, you, you can't say you love God and not keep his commands. So you can't divorce your love for God, love for people, and ditch the scriptures and the commands of God in the process, and that still be loving. 
It becomes a religion where truth is unknowable and irrelevant. And in the end, I would say this, it is a religion that is simply that, a religion. It is not genuine Christianity. The message of 2 John is this. If you wanna make progress in your Christian faith, you have to understand that progress comes by abiding in the truth, not running past the truth, amen? It comes by abiding in the truth, not running hard past the truth. So I would just say this, stay in the word, stay with the word, stay close to the cross. That word stay, 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 hover around the truth, make the truth the central part of your life. Stay put, stay put, stay put around the gospel of Jesus Christ, the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, stay there. Stay there, stay there, keep your eyes focused there. Bow down at the foot of the cross. Don't run a hundred miles past the cross, amen? Abide, abide, abide. That's progress. And I know that doesn't feel like progress. That's progress. That's progress. It doesn't get any better than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing else out there is better than who Jesus Christ is, what Jesus Christ has done, that he's coming again. Uh, number two, progress comes by walking in the truth, not walking past the truth. Number three, progress comes by aligning with the truth, not expecting the truth to align with you. I jotted this down this morning. It's a little snarky, but do what you want with it. Do you, I just, I just wrote, do you, do you actually think, do you actually think that the Bible is wrong and misguided and God sent you here to fix it? <sighs> Are we still friends? <laughs> like, what? So I can't tell if people are leaving to go to the bathroom or if you're mad and leaving. <laughs> but I see you leaving and I will pay attention if you come back in or not, because I'm watching. <laughs> Let me introduce you to a word, okay? Here's the word, repent. There's nothing wrong with the Bible. There's a lot wrong with you. You need to repent and align with the Bible. And the Bible is good to us because the Bible is honest. It tells us the truth about who we are so that we can be right with God. That's progress. Progress comes by embracing the Bible as it is, not by being embarrassed that it doesn't align with culture. I think there is a tinge of embarrassment in people. They're like, Christianity is great, but what do we do with the Bible? Christianity is great, what do we do with these passages of scripture? Well, here's what you do. You do what they say. You, ab you abide in the word, you stick to the script, right? You, you should have no room for embarrassment in your heart whatsoever. God's word is perfect and true and pure and it is perfect in every way. Lastly, I would say this progress comes by letting the Bible change you rather than you trying to change the Bible. The epitome of arrogance is that. I'm not gonna change, I want the Bible to change. I, I, I wanna show you this quote, I'm gonna put it on the screen here. Put it up here, Francis Schaeffer said this, and that's a great quote, I'll close with this. Just as you think about truth. Truth carries with it confrontation. Truth demands confrontation, loving confrontation, but confrontation nevertheless. And here it is. If our reflex action is always accommodation, regardless of the centrality of the truth involved, there is something wrong. And that's what we see in culture today. That's what John is trying to help us to see. Just stay with the truth. Just abide in the truth. Stop clamoring for a new truth that isn't truth. Just stick with the gospel in front of you. 
right? Abide in the cross of Christ. Walk in the truths that you already know. And that, my friends, is progress. Amen? That's progressive Christianity in this day and age. Actually staying with the word, believing the word, and obeying the word in a culture that can't stand what the word says. Walk in it. Believe it. Trust it. Live it out. Stay put in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is John's message to us. Amen? So how many of you hear this, you receive this teaching, you're like, all right, I get it, I see it. That's progress. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, let's pray together. God, help us today to understand what true progress is. Help us today to abide in the truth, not run past it. Help us to walk in the truth, not walk past it. Help us to, to, to align with the truth, not expect the truth to align with us. Help us to repent where we need to repent. Help us to embrace the Bible, not be embarrassed by it. And Lord, help us today. Help us today to let the Bible change us rather than us trying to change the Bible. So I pray, Lord, that you would just sweep through this place today in a powerful way. Help us to repent where we need to repent. And then would you give us strength of conviction and courage that we would embrace the truth no matter what. That we would walk in the truth when everyone's trying to run past it. That we would stay put at the cross. We would embrace the resurrection and we would realize that the old gospel truth is the best truth of all. And that's progress. Help us to stay grounded in the word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen.